Robin, um, you had a particular challenge with this film. Um, first of all, with a, with any documentary coming along at the very beginning of Will's journey and not knowing exactly where his recovery would lead him, um, but also having a collaborator in Will because he was a filmmaker. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about that collaboration, coming, working with a filmmaker as your subject, um, but also when you came into the story and and how you knew that you needed to keep keep following this? Yeah, so I can, I can back up to give a little context, but so I lived in Boston and I worked for Boston University as a video producer. So I was shooting and editing short documentaries for them. And the story kind of came to me as a news story initially. And, uh, you know, a faculty member told me what had happened to Will. He had been a student and had taught at BU. And so, you know, they wanted the greater community to know about that. And so it started as a news piece as I was getting ready to uh, relocate to Austin. I r really enjoyed working with Will. I mean, his just loved his personality and how hardworking he is and um, asked if I could work on a short story with him, a short documentary. And... Um, it wasn't until he was approved for the arm transplant, so after the short documentary, that I n thought there was enough material to make a feature documentary. So it was really kind of an organic process. Um, but yeah, Will as a filmmaker, I mean, it was, I thought it was really positive in the sense that it gave the audience a true feeling for what it would be like to lose their own arms, to lose their own hands, and just to empathize, um, to be able to try to understand um, how we use them each and every day and how critical they are, just get through the day and to be able to see his artwork, I thought was a really fantastic component of the film. Um, and then also to have someone that I could talk to about the process, someone who is a filmmaker who understands um, what would be cinematic. I mean, that that's something that I enjoyed is to be able to talk with Will about his experiences and I would have ideas about how I wanted to communicate that on the screen and oftentimes we'd be on the same page because you know he knows what is cinematic, what looks beautiful, um, you know, process-oriented things, and it so it was helpful for us to be able to have a shared language. And he also understood how important it was for me as a director to want to make sure that the vulnerability was communicated. And so he was open to you know when I would ask him, "What can I film from your perspective?" what would you be willing to share? And and he was willing to let me put a GoPro on him in some really intimate moments that I think made the film even more special. Um, so yeah, so I think that that was really positive. And, um, and then just the support that we got from the hospital and continuing that, that made it possible that they were able to uh, grant us full access and that they trusted in us um, and that they saw the short. I showed them the short and they that gave them um, the idea that, that we would be respectful and that it would be good quality and that, th that they would want to get behind it. Um, but he is now kind of gradually getting back into filmmaking, and I think that this is helpful. He's been on tour with the, with the feature, and he's working on his own projects. I mean, it's going to take a lot of time, and um, it just it zaps a lot of energy when you, lose, you, when you lose that much just to get through each day. Um, but I think in general it's been a pretty positive experience. One thing that is so great about how you chose to film Will um, is really making him own the story and then also taking our attention away from the disability to focus on the person. And can you talk a little bit about how you were thinking about representation and and how how you would frame him on screen to to have him come across that we see him and not and not the disability? Yeah. Well, really early on when I was working first for the news story for BU. I noticed that he was cracking jokes. And actually, that's what I, I felt like I really admired that about him, that he could be going through so much and experiencing so much emotional and physical pain. And to have this really dark but awesome sense of humor was just wonderful. And I thought that that needed to be a part of the film. He had initially no intention to do stand-up, um, but I encouraged him to do it because I thought that would be a great way for us to communicate that side of of will of his personality and his strength um and so that i really wanted it to be balanced because it it to me was very tragic what happened but he was such a hard worker and i knew that there would be some positive things that would come through so that was a key component and in terms of the visuals i just i wanted 
to film as close to Will as possible, just so that people could really get in there and experience it and try to empathize with him and to see the experience through his eyes. Dr. Freeman, something that Robin told me before um, we got into the panel today is that you um, are actually very close with a lot of the surgeons that were on Will's team. Uh, can you talk a little about your involvement um, with the experimental surgeries and, and your background? Well, I'll try not to talk too much about my background. This, I mean, I, I, what I will say is Robin has just put this film together that brings out so many aspects of why I dedicated my career to transplantation, first of all, but second of all, about all of the components that come into play here. The science and the surgery is fantastic and wonderful, um, but it really comes down to the humanity, our own individual humanity of the caregivers, of the patient, of the, of the team, of the donors, and it's so great that you're here today too. Um, sh you really just wound it all together in a way that really brings all of those aspects out. So, so yes, yeah, so Bo Pom Pomahawk and, and I, I was the chairman of the board of the New England Organ Bank, which uh, Mr. Luskin gave a, a fantastic, you know, 30 second talk there, but he was, he was instrumental in, in allowing the Brigham's team to really pull together and start doing these kinds of highly experimental transplants. And when I was on the board, there was, a, there was a lot of controversy for the transplant surgeons to allow them to come and do these donor operations. It takes them many, many hours to procure the, the arms, the legs, the face, whatever it is they're doing, um, which was not standard for those of us who had trained doing organ transplants as opposed to limb transplants. So there was, there was that whole aspect of the experimentalness of this as well that um, that the organ bank and, and those of us in leadership there tried to embrace to bring this forward. I think Robin and I talked about this already. Th this is one of the most um, um, important parts of this film, I think, is, is that there are so many aspects of this that are experimental. And the whole, at the very end of there, like you, so some people would look at that and say, that, well, what are you, crazy? You're going to do more transplants after that? Um, but the truth of the matter is, Somebody took the first dose of penicillin and didn't know what was going to happen. Somebody took the first kidney transplant uh, that, John, that Joe Murray did. They didn't know it was going to work. And so without these kinds of, these kinds of incredibly cur courageous people and the donors who, who support them and saying, yeah, you know, that, that transplant might not work out, but my loved one wanted to see this happen and knows that most of the time good comes from them. So I, I think this, we can talk a lot about the experimental uh, surgery and experimenting in medicine, but um, you know, it doesn't always turn out the way it turned out for Will as well. So anyway. And, and from where you sit, where do you see the future of, of transplant surgery going? Well, it's, um, the immunosuppression issue is gonna always be there until we get to the point of stem cells being able to generate organs and test tubes. And there's a lot of research going on there. Um, the interesting thing about this case, and, it, and Robin again brought it out in the film, is that you know he, he this was not life and death. Um, he was alive. You could argue about how well he was, but he was alive. Immunosuppression can be lethal, and it can cause um, you know um, complications that people die from. And so way back the you know back when the Merricks did their transplant, um, people died of kidney failure. There was no dialysis. And that got them going. Um, heart transplants, liver transplants, same thing. They're really, those are life-saving transplants. And so the risks of the immunosuppression are not, are, are you could argue, are justified. But in this case, um, not so much. Uh, I think, as, as Dr. Pomahawk um, mentioned, when immunosuppression gets to be much less riskier, those kinds of transplants will occur um, uh, more frequently. But then sooner or later, we're going to, develop better artificial limbs, better artificial organs, and maybe even someday grow, grow organs and tissues in, in the test tube from your own tissue, which means there will be a no rejection problem to, to deal with. So anyway. Because we're in science on screen today, I'm going to ask you two more <laughs> questions on that topic. Um, one is, what, was the, what are some of the essential breakthroughs in medical technology that allowed us to go from transplanting organs to limbs? And, and what did it take for us to cross that threshold? I was talking to my medical students yesterday. That's a really fun thing about having a new medical school because we were, we were talking about um, 
in the course of my career in transplantation, pretty much everything has evolved. All of these things that went from the laboratory to actual bedside clinical care uh, have occurred in 20, 25 years. Um, so a couple of the things, the, the understanding of how to really sew those blood vessels uh, together under the microscope has, you know, that wasn't happening in the 60s and 70s at all. And now that's a routine thing, not even just in transplants, but for just all kinds of reconstructive surgery. So that's one thing. Um, another thing that's really critical is, and, and you, you all probably remember Christopher Reeves, Superman. He actually, the, he really stimulated uh, funding for the study of regeneration of nerves. Uh, he was a spinal cord injury patient, but but the fact that we know now that a nerve that ends up here can actually grow all the way back down to the arm. When I went to medical school, the, the dogma was nerves don't grow. They don't regenerate. And in fact, that's all happened now. And that makes it possible to consider. I mean, you wouldn't want to transplant an arm if there was no sensation, if there was no, um, no muscular control. Uh, and that's what nerves are required to do that. It would be, it would be useless, really. It wouldn't achieve the, the goals if you tried to do that. And then the last thing I will say is that we understand immunosuppression so much better now than we did before. Um, it was way too risky to do that kind of thing with the immunosuppression we were using in the 80s and 90s. Um, but now we understand how to, to manage that. Now it's interesting, you know, everything's connected to everything. And a lot of the HIV research that, that people did to figure out what does HIV do to the immune system actually translated beautifully to understanding the immunosuppressed immune system. when when it's done intentionally, when we give the drug to do what the HIV virus does unintentionally. So, so I'd, I'd say those are the main things that's happened since then. Linda, I would love to hear your um, organ donation story. Can you share that with us? I can. I'm, I'm always um, honored to be asked. Our donation story, um, while the, the ultimate donation didn't happen until 2009, started in about 1979, when I had a friend, I was all of about 20, 25 years old, and one of my friends received a kidney a, through donation, and she named it Stuart, and it allowed her to be off of dialysis, and we could run around and be kids. And through that experience, I thought, if the time ever come, you don't ever want the time to come when you're in that spot of being able to give an organ or say yes to organ donation. Um, but we knew that if that time came, I would say yes in a heartbeat, uh, just from knowing that story. And if I could go back and tell Stuart's family <laughs> that we're still talking about him. Mm -hmm. um, that happened in San Antonio years. So it's been, you know, many years ago. So. In 2009, my husband was one month short of his 60th birthday. It still chokes me up to talk about it, but um, he was coming home from work Friday afternoon. He called me. I said, dinner is on the stove. It's your favorite, <laughs> sausage and potatoes. We don't have any ice. Bring some ice. He's like, okay, I'll be there in a minute. I'll bring a bag of ice. I love you. I love you. See you in a minute. And that was the last time I talked to him. Um, he didn't get home as quickly as I thought he should, and I thought the traffic on 35 has got to be awful. I, I called back his cell phone and said, where are you? <laughs> like, dinner's on the stove. <laughs> it's it's going to get cold. Um, and I, I hung up because it went straight to his voicemail. And I... Uh, I hung up and the phone rang not three minutes later and this lady said, my name is Jennifer and I'm a social worker at Breckenridge Hospital and there's been an accident. Um, he was driving right here south of town and cutting across the back roads because he hated that traffic on 35 because they, all the crazy drivers, they drive too fast. So he's on the back road and in his little truck, one of those little baby kind of pickups. Um, and he was a very tall man. I should tell you all about Dennis. He, he was tall, weighed like 180 pounds from when he was 18 years old until he was a month short of 60. I don't know how he did that. 
Um, but and he was six foot four, and he thought he was 10 years old in his brain. He would jump out of trees and from rooftop to rooftop. And one of his favorites, he had just got this toy where it was a, a scooter, and he would ride with one leg, with one leg out like a you know, ballerina, and fly down the hill by our house. I mean, he was just an overgrown child. Um, but, <laughs> but he was mine. <laughs> um, and so he's stopped it, behind this lady um, on this little two-lane highway, and the lady had her blinker on to turn left, and so he stopped behind her. And it, when we were driving together, I would go around her through the ditch, and he'd go, you're going to get a ticket. I, but he followed the rules, so he was waiting behind her. And as he waited, this duly pickup, cattle guard, giant pickup, four wheels in the back, came around this curve. And we don't know what the man was doing, but he did not apply his brakes. And he hit my husband's pickup from the back at about 60 miles an hour. And it looks from the, the pickup was bent in half long ways, like the tail of the truck got bent up into the air. And it was crushed more on the driver's side than the passenger side. Like maybe Dennis saw the man coming and said, I'm going to get out of the way. And so, and it hit him and then shot him like a pool ball. If you hit it just right, it shot him through a field, through a fence, past a telephone pole. Today there's a house built in that field where that happened. Um, so they helicoptered him. He was the only injury in this accident, and it was an accident. Nobody did it on purpose, um, but he was waiting, and the lady in front of him, the car or the truck after it hit him went on to hit her as well and pushed her about a city block down the road. It was a woman and her three-month-old baby in the back seat in his car seat. And so, you know, D Dennis took the, the hit and probably saved that child's life. Um, but he was the only injury. So they helicoptered him to Breckenridge Hospital. And so my daughter and I, my daughter, was, we had five kids. My daughter was the only one home. We got in the car, drove. I broke land speed records getting to <laughs> Breckenridge Hospital. Um, and when I got into the ER, they ushered me in right away. And Dennis was laying there with his eyes open. And, and at that point in my life, I had come from working in the funeral business. And, and to me, when I walk into the room and, and see a body laying there without a soul, there's a, there's a look. It's very unscientific, but that's, you know, you can just, you can see a soul in somebody's eyes when they're in there. And when I walked into that ER, he wasn't in there. But they said, don't worry, come with us. We're going to let you stay with him. We're still working on him. And that was like 8 o'clock at night on a Friday night. They worked on him hard. I told the doctor this morning, that night I realized doctors and nurses really do work hard. They did stuff to him all night long. They let me sit by his bedside and hold his hand, and they, they worked this incredible marathon of activity trying to put life back in him. And nothing was happening, and nothing was happening. And, and so as I sat there, until the next morning. They told me in the morning, we're going to do this brain scan and see if what we're doing is working, is helping. And so as I sat there all night long, I, uh, I had time to think about Debbie, my friend from 1979, and that kidney, and that I knew in my heart Dennis was not here. He, he had left us in that car accident the night before. And all night long, and we never signed these donor cards. We were not on a registry. It's just a thing we knew we were going to do. So, like, 
It's on my list of things to do. I'll do it later. <laughs> and, but we had never done it. And I thought, oh, no, we, can't, we cannot let this moment pass without being able to do some good in the world. We couldn't change what was happening to us. There was no way to bring him back, but we had to find some way to do good, for good to come out of what was happening to us. And so I'm sitting there all night long, and I'm having these thoughts, and I'm thinking, if I raise my hand and say, can you tell me about, don't forget to tell me about organ donation. Will that sound bad? Because I'm, <laughs> you know, but I didn't want the moment to pass. And, and, but I didn't say anything, because I didn't want to sound that way. And they went and did the test, and so, they came back and they said there's no activity, whatever kind of test they did, and no matter what, when we, if we take him off of these machines that are keeping his body breathing and his heart beating, he's, he's not going to be here. And we have somebody here to talk to you from the Texas Oregon Sharing Alliance. And I thought, oh, thank God, mm -hmm. uh, because that's what I was worried about. I didn't want the moment to be, I didn't want him to just go away. And because Stuart's still here and doing good, you know? <laughs> and I thought, this is not fair. <laughs> Dennis needs to be here and doing good. And so we went and signed these papers. And, and when we came back into the room, it was one of the most memorable moments of this entire incredibly horrible weekend that as we sat in the room waiting all night long and those doctors and nurses were working on him, there was just this awful energy, gray death and dying hanging in the air and sadness, such sadness. And when we signed those papers and we walked back into the room, it was like, a newborn nursery. The sun was coming out there in his room. It was such an incredible shift. And they let all of, all of the family came from New York and South Dakota, and we, they gave us time for everybody to fly in and say their whatever they needed to say and be there. And then we all left him together. And from that, there was um, his kidney, or one of his kidneys, and his liver went to a woman in San Antonio who wrote me a beautiful thank you note. I've never met any of these people, and I've met many recipients of organs, and I've come to understand that what, what they must feel because, because they know the other side. But she wrote me a beautiful thank you note. And she's like my age, and she hadn't been able to play outside with her grandkids for five years. And that gift allowed her to be out there playing with her kids again. His heart, he was so healthy. His heart went to a man in Mississippi. And, um, and I always tease his other kidney went to somebody around Chicago. And Dennis hated the cold, so I'm not <laughs> sure how he is with that. Um, <laughs> but we always tease him. North of Austin is too cold. We can't go there. Um, but, and we talked to my, one of my granddaughters was about six at the time, and, and we talked about, we gave his, his eyes, his corneas, and so someone can sh see. And she said, Gammy, this is good news. When he, when he sees us, he'll, they'll know us. He'll be there. <laughs> and I thought, oh. Mm -hmm. So it just, I, that was our experience. And I can't imagine having all of those things presented to you in the middle of all the loss and the grief and that our world was being turned upside down that afternoon. For that to be the first time that we ever thought about organ donation, I don't. I'd like to think that I would say yes in that moment, but I, but I already knew the answer, and so it it for our family was a part of the blessing of finding some way to make the good go on, and so like Stuart, that if we could just go back and tell his family he's still making a difference today because we said yes because they said yes, 
And so I know all those families who received Dennis's organs and tissues in 30 years, in 40 years, his life is still going to be making a difference because those people are going to say yes. So, and whether you say yes to donation in that moment or say no, talk about it with your family. That's so important. Let your family and friends know what your choice is so they don't have to worry about that too in that moment. Thank so you important. so much for telling us Thank this you. incredible story. And probably now we all know, so thank you. Yeah. Now we all know what to do. Yes, so probably a question for Dr. Freeman. Can you talk about um, the time period where the organs are still viable and does it change from organ to organ? It does change from organ to organ for, for the, these transplants with arms and faces, are, they're called composite tissue transplants because they have nerves, blood vessels, muscles, skin all together. And so they're so new, I, nobody really knows how long they'll last, which is part of the whole experimental question. Um, the longest surviving liver transplant is about 45 years now. It's the longest su surviving kidney transplant. In fact, there's a big controversy in the U.S. As, you know, as many people die with a functioning organ as organs fail after kidney transplant. So there's a whole question about, well, should you give kidneys to people who are in their 60s, for example, when you know that kidney is going to function longer than that person, so to speak. Um, and the interesting about the livers, too, is the liver regenerates. You all know the, the, the story of Prometheus in Greek mythology, and that's actually, it regenerates. So there's no real limit on how long the liver will survive. Heart transplants, there, there, are, there are probably 10 to 15 year limits, but everybody's different. A lot of it depends on the immune reaction to that organ, and, and some of it depends on what the condition of the organ was when it was transplanted. So healthy donors donating hearts, those hearts are likely to last much longer than maybe somebody who's a smoker or something like that. A question um, is how are these surgeries paid for? Because in the film, Robin indicates in the end credits that insurance often doesn't pay for these surgeries. So in, I can speak about Will's case in particular. And so the hospital donated the time. So all the doctors donated their time for the surgery. The Brigham and Women's Hospital then went to the insurance companies to, to make sure that they would cover Will's drugs. So his immunosuppressant drugs, he has to take those for the rest of his life, and they wanted to make sure that that would be covered. And then in terms of how these procedures get funded and uh, the research and the development, um, a lot of it's coming from the military um, through the Department of Defense. Um, and so there's, they're getting big grants, like, you know, for the arm transplants and the face transplants, that's mainly how all of these doctors were able to fund that research. Okay, so the question is, um, what are some of the practices that were referred to in the end credits also about the experimentation with immunosuppressant drugs, and what are people doing that we haven't learned yet on the U.S. side? I can just say what I, I know from the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and then maybe you can have, you know, fill in the information. But so the Brigham and Women's Hospital, I know a few years ago, started some clinical trials. And so there was a woman who received a face transplant. And the really fascinating thing about rejection is that when you receive arms or a face, they're external to the body. So in real time, you can see a rash and the doctors can very quickly biopsy the spot and on the skin where the rash has occurred to see if the bodies, if the immune system is targeting the arms or the faces. And so those patients who have received those transplants can really help with the research. And so there was this woman, Charla Nash, they were doing clinical trials essentially to try to wean her off the drugs because they want to try to make it as, um, they want to try to minimize the toxicity and her face started to reject. So they put her quickly back on the drug. She's okay now. Um, but that's as far as I know they've been um, working on immunosuppression research at, at the Brigham. And you might have more information about, you know, what's going on internationally or what's happened since. Yeah, sure. So it's, it's a fascinating topic, and it's sort of the same as the, what the whole limb transplant brings up. Is so if you have a functioning organ, it's going well, you're on these drugs, you've got to take them every day, it's a complicated regimen, maybe you feel headaches or shaky from them. Are you willing to risk the rejection response? Going back in the hospital maybe 
maybe even a rejection response that's not reversible uh, even, um, or potentially end up with more than just a rash but lose skin on, on those cases, which is ultimately what Joe Murray was talking about when they originally started doing skin transplants back in World War II. Um, so the question is, ethically, do you, and, and for an individual person, do you really want to take those risks? Um, there has been lots of trials. Most of them have failed. Some of them ha have been successful for a few patients. It's, it's one of the holy grails that we're looking for is being able to identify before you start that weaning process who is going to respond well and who's not. Right now, we really can't tell. But this such a, it's such a um, universal problem in transplantation that all over the world people are doing these experiments. And every once in a while you hear a, about a study where yeah, it was very successful, it was a great thing, and then three years later, half of those patients are back on immunosuppression and maybe even somebody lost a graft from it. So, so I don't think there's any you know, miraculous um, protocol out there yet that will um, solve this problem. Uh, but it does raise all these interesting questions. It's even more interesting if it's if it's a life-saving transplant. You know, if you have a liver transplant or a, or a heart transplant, are you willing to take those risks? Are those drugs so bad that you're willing to take the risk of a rejection episode and maybe even losing the, the transplant? And for most people, it's probably a very easy answer. Um, but <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> maybe not. It, well, it, it, it's just the same question. There are people, you could say that Will's dilemma about whether to do the transplant or not was easy for a lot of people to say, no way. Yeah. You know, there's, there's been whatever the, you know, t a couple handfuls of people who've done that before. Some of them have been very successful, but a lot of people would say, no way, I'm not doing that. So it's, it's an individual choice, and fortunately, some people are willing to take those risks. So the question is, how can we follow Will's story um, moving forward? Well, we have a Facebook page, a Twitter account, uh, a website. We actually have a um, mailing list sign up in the lobby. So if you want to give us your email address um, or on our website, you can sign up and we'll be, um, you know, we've been posting about um, his progress and also about our film, where it's going. But um, in terms of how he's doing, he's great. He's been little by little gaining more and more independence so he can feed himself. Um, before with his prostheses, he couldn't use, um, he had a hard time using the, the bathroom, and so now he's, he has a lot more independence there. So just in terms of like the, the tasks of daily living, you know, he's getting more and more functioning out of his hands. And he's been going on tour with the film and um, just making a lot of connections at festivals, and he's just really grateful. And so he says that he would do it over again, that, you know, there was, there's a lot of commitment to, to rehab and there is the risk of rejection, but for him, um, it's been a blessing in his life. Great question. So there's so many um, issues that the movie puts you know, front and center, and one is this issue of personal attendance, and um, this audience member noted how these are often low-wage workers, but they're critical um, to disabled people and them getting their, their, being able to live their lives. So can you talk a little bit about your observations around personal attendance um, and home caregivers? I could say just from my personal experience with Will, um, it was, it's really hard on Angel, you know, and he, he does um, do it with such grace and he loves Will, but I think that many people are put into a situation like that, um, you know, when parents are experiencing dementia and, you know, disabilities happen. And so, you know, if we have loved ones who need help and we love them, you know, we help them. And so that's that is definitely a difficult situation for Angel. In terms of um, how Steve came into the picture and you know how he gets compensated, that in Massachusetts there's um, Social Security, and so Will qualified to receive Social Security. You know he's a taxpayer before all of this happened, and um, you know so the state has set aside a certain amount of money, and that he can use to hire personal care assistants, and Steve is just one of them, and. I'm sure that that varies from state to state. I'm, I don't know, you know, all of the details, but, and I don't know what the minimum wage is. You know, I know that it varies quite a bit, but I would, I would think for sure that people should be paid a living wage, you know, no matter what they're doing <laughs> for their job. Like we should all make enough money to get by and not have to struggle to take care of our families and to just, you know, 
pay for rent, which is, there are a lot of issues that I feel strongly about. Um, but yeah, for sure, I mean, that's really important work and people should be compensated for their time. But I, I don't think that everyone's obviously as, as lucky as Will to have such a, a beautiful, loving family and partner and friends. Um, so many people, you know, would deliver meals and helped when, you know, they they had to have their apartment renovated. A lot of us went over and helped to paint and scrape wallpaper and just do anything. You know, we would all rally. We'd use Facebook um, to get together to help. Um, but yeah, not everyone's in a position like that. I don't know if you have any more insight about the institutions and, you know, the funding. Well, I, w uh, I wish I had a lot more insight about th those things, but um, one of the things that's critical for successful transplantation is is a caregiver network that is there, and we actually, s and and, it, and it, the doctors uh, in the film actually mentioned it, that you you really need to have a stable social situation because, you know, Will's physical disabilities were were extreme and he needed a lot of help, but actually the the medical regimen, all the doctor visits, all the stress, everything really requires a, a strong support system whether they're paid for or not. And oftentimes we reject candidates when they really don't have, they can't document that. Um, I don't know, I've only been to Texas for two years, so I don't know enough about what's available in Texas, but, but and in fact in the, in the transplant world in general, paid help didn't really qualify for that emotional support network. Having an, an angel, can, I mean, his name is apt for sure, um, uh, and other other members of the family being there who have an, a real emotional investment uh, are critical to getting through that. And it, again, it's it's so great that you you've brought out all of these different aspects of, of this story that are really you know kind of universal. Actually, it's really good. So we're almost out of time. So Robin, I know you had a few other issues you wanted to touch on. So can is there is there anything that we we should we I should just, cover? I just before? wanted to say a quick thanks, actually, because you know the film production lasted four years. Uh, it was filmed in Boston. Post production lasted for a year, and it really does take a village to make a movie. And you know it's it's hard work. And so a lot of people that are here today, you know, supported our project. So I, I want to thank all of our friends who are are here and help with transcripts. You know, they volunteered, they gave us advice, they gave um, feedback on rough cuts. We had friends that made really generous donations. Um, our producer here, Brian Davies, he was, he's been on the project since day one. You know, we couldn't have done it without his support. Um, our friend Neil Wilson, I think, is gone, but huge supporter. Um, and I wanted to thank you, Holly. You've been a mentor <laughs> since 2013 on our project, Austin Film Society, uh, for the grants, for the advice and support. Um, Dr. Freeman and Linda for sharing your stories and for the important work that you're doing to raise awareness and day in and day out, you know, support people, support to improve their lives, the quality of their lives. And um, Texas Organ Sharing Alliance, A. Glyph, and Dell Medical. Just want to thank everyone for coming out today, too, for being here for us. And how can we, we, we know to follow you on Facebook, but the film is sort of on a journey toward yeah. distribution. So yeah. um, we should continue to spread the word about it and let people know that um, to follow you on Facebook and Twitter so we can hear about where to see the film next. Yeah, actually, yeah, please, if you, if you have Facebook, Twitter, if you could follow us, that'd be great. And, you know, we're working on that. So our goal is to um, continue getting it out on the festival circuit and also um, on television and you know get it into universities to, to be used as an educational tool and then eventually um, video streaming services you know like like the Netflixes yeah <laughs> <laughs> thank you all so much for joining us for science on screen um, and that congratulations Robin on a job well done it's an amazing movie and thank you to our panelists who I'm sure will say hello to you so thanks for joining us